The Orpington Cricket Cast is sponsored by Chelsfield Electrical, The Chelsfield Pub, Cook and Matthew Sport, Gaz Tech, J&K Coach Tours, Langford Printers and Language Link UK Limited. Thank you very much for your continued support. Oh, I want to be with a world just like you. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the uh, Orpington Cricket Cast uh, with myself, Big Mac and Cube. Uh, we are delighted to bring you another very, very special guest uh, this week. Uh, so to do the honourable introductions, Mr Cube. Thank you, Big Mac. Um, so we're spoiling the people today. This is our, uh, our second uh County player that we have uh, we've brought onto the, the podcast, former player for, for Middlesex and, and Kent, of course. Um, just the 61 first class matches and the 81 uh, list A matches, 170 first class wickets, um, 1,250 first class runs. Uh, he was also the Orpington Cricket uh, Pro in 2002. Um, with 365 runs and chipping in with just the 11 wickets. Um, now runs his own cricket academy, level four coach by his own right. We're delighted to have Jamie Hewitt with us today. How are you, Jamie? I'm very well, boys. I'm very well. How are we? Not too bad. Not too bad. I suppose, how are you coping at the moment with um, obviously COVID uh, causing restrictions on everything and, and stuff like that? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not ideal, um, but unfortunately, it is what it is. I think the weather's great because we're, you know, not having to do anything. But that's the flip side of that is we could be actually playing loads of loads of cricket. But uh, keeping ourselves busy with um, Middlesex stuff. Um, so we do a lot of work still with the Middlesex Academy boys. Even though I think quite a lot of counties have sort of just stopped all cricket. So we're doing sort of two or three. Zooms things with the academy boys um, and all the, the county boys from 11 up to 15. So keeping busy, um, I've stopped all my um, academy stuff. Um, I'm working for the school. We're doing a little, little bit of online stuff with the cricketers. So keeping busy, um, but yeah, it's, it's not ideal. But we're all in the same boat, unfortunately. But hopefully, you know, it's changing every day. So you know, we can have one to ones now and. I think next week we might be able to have a net situation. So, yeah, it's, it's moving in the right direction. Um, yeah, that, exactly. I was going to say, obviously, the ECB have announced uh, only in the last couple of days that once one nets will be fine. So, hopefully, more and more um, actual cricket is being paid rather than the, uh, I suppose, the online stuff. Yeah, very much so. So we'll go we'll go back a little bit with you then, Jamie. Um, yeah. I ask you, I, I tend to ask sort of like where the first memories of cricket come from. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit, but I want yeah. I want to ask where the love of cricket came from. Um, it's probably my dad. I think um, my earliest memory is well, I'm told it was about five. Um, I just go and watch my dad. My dad was quite a good club cricket. He played for Watney's, the brewery, um, up in Richmond. And my earliest memory of cricket is basically just, well, I suppose, every boy who's played cricket or man who's played cricket, that at some stage you sat on the boundary and watched a member of your family or friend play. And my dad probably um, watching him play was probably my earliest memory. Um, he took me to Twickenham. That's where I started playing cricket. He took me there when I was five. But I think the love of, of cricket is is watching dad play um, on the boundary, doing a bit of scoring uh, and just watching. I always remember watching the cricket during the summer um, on the BBC. That was probably the, and that just grew from there. Um, so that's probably where the love of cricket comes from. What sort of series is would you have been watching on the BBC? So just the, the test matches, the, when um, the BBC One had the test matches, the home test matches, um, I remember listening, um, I remember my dad, me and my dad got up once uh, in the winter around four o'clock in the morning and turned the radio on and listened to England versus Pakistan, some far reach country. Um, that's always a, a weird memory. Not that, not much like that now, I'm afraid. Cool, perfect. So when did you... Um sort of get picked up by Middlesex and, and what sort of age were you then? 
Um, so I started when I was five at Twickenham. We used to on Twickenham Green every Sunday, like most clubs is. Um, and then when I was ten, I went for a Middlesex trial. Um, didn't get in. And then when I turned eleven, I went went again. Um, and that's when I basically that was my first recollection of, of county cricket as it was then. It was. Um, and then sort of just went through, I think, 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s. Um, and when I was 15, I didn't get picked, actually. I got dropped when I was 15. Um, but yeah, under 11s, uh, under 11s were the first introduction of, of, of county cricket, as, as it was then. Um, and just playing uh, for Twickenham as, as well as a, a youngster as well. Did you, did you always, were you always a bowler? Were you always a, or were you a batsman when you were younger? Or? I, th I I did a bit of, of both. I was very small um, when I was young. Like when I got to sixteen, I I shot up to to, to six foot three, what I am now. And but growing up, I was I was always a small child. Um, and I for, for Middlesex, I bowled. I, I remember I was a bowler. And back then, if you bowled, you didn't bat, and if you batted, you didn't bowl. And so um, I always I was predominantly a, a bowler, but batted as well. Um, up until I was actually 16, I didn't, when I, I didn't get picked when I was 15, I thought my world was ended. Um, and then I grew and I, I, I then started batting as well and actually got into the Middlesex on the 16s as a batter and didn't bowl. Um, and then a year later when I was 17, I came back after a winter and I'd grown quite a lot and that's when the bowling really took off from there. Cool, awesome. So you obviously flirted with it from, from quite a young age then to, to be honest like how, how do you see the uh, the county set up now compared to when when you were uh, you were there is it similar or is it as a lot no, uh, it's completely different I mean growing up we I think from a, a trial perspective um, we just you got nominated um, and they had Middlesex just had mass trials at Finchley Indoor Centre which is where the boys train now and obviously we have work as well um, they just had mass trials and then they picked it might have been over one or two weeks that you went for an hour and they basically just picked the best, I don't know, 15, 16 out of however many they had. It must have been, well, I'd say hundreds. Um, and that was it. Whereas the process now is so, the structure is unbelievable. There's a three tier structure from a Middlesex perspective. You have borough cricket, regional cricket, and then obviously county cricket, and then elite elite cricket which obviously the, is the academy so completely different um but resources back then um when i was growing up if you know, the, the coach was a, a school teacher because he had the whole summer off and he could do all of that so i, I, I presume they're all they were all volunteer coaches as well they didn't get paid maybe a few expenses but it was purely every cricket coach that i came across was a, a PE teacher as well who had a, a love for the game as well so whereas now obviously it's slightly more professional Okay. So, your first county game. Now, there's a lot of trust going into uh, what I find online, but it was against Oxford University, I believe. Yes. So, let's. What's your What's your memories of your your first experience? Obviously, being in the first team. Who were Who were potentially some of the players that you're playing with? Like you were you, you're working with. Be interesting to hear a bit about that. It was. I think. Um, it was. I knew a couple of days before that I was going to play. Um, like back then, the first class games were basically Oxford and Cambridge, and that was it. There's no UCT stuff or anything like that. So I think um, Don Bennett, who used to be the first team coach of Middlesex, um, he's no longer with us. Um, I think he told me two days before um, that we're going to play a few youngsters. Um, and I'd been doing well. Um, but I think, you know, you look back and think what the memorable, memorable bits of your career was, obviously first getting a contract and getting called into laws to sign a contract. And, and I didn't actually see the game against Oxford. Um, it wasn't a highlight, it's not the right word, because it, I think it rained as well. Um, but just being in that environment with, you know, the likes of Gatting, Ramprakash, all those boys, um, it wasn't because you'd obviously trained with them throughout the winter and stuff as well. So I don't think I was in awe. It was just, I don't, I didn't realize what it was until I actually made my first class debut, um, walked out and onto Lords and stuff. I think that's when it really hit me. I think, geez, no, this is, this is it. This is big time in terms of first class cricket. So, um, 
it was exciting, um, but there was quite a few youngsters playing in that game, if I remember, that I'd grown up with as well. So it was almost like they're just my mates playing cricket, whereas <laughs> I think if you fast-forwarded it, I think, I don't know if it was that, that year or later, maybe the first class table, that you actually think, Christ, he's a good player, I'll bowl at him and X, Y and Z. So, yeah, it was, that's probably uh, in terms of the excitement levels. Cool. So before we divulge um, into the, the county career, anything from you, Big Matt? Uh, no, I mean, I obviously, shocking as it may be to people who've ever seen me play cricket, never got near the, the county setup as a child, but seeing now all the regional setups, there's so many more opportunities for for the best kids at the club level to, to play much more competitive cricket. You know, sometimes you see these the Colts games and the 24 overs of one team annihilating the other team, and it's a bit pointless, but giving them that opportunity now, I think it is, it's nice to have those little incremental steps where they can just play more competitive stuff from an early age. Yeah, absolutely. I think, middle, I mean, you know, I'm obviously going to boast a little bit, but the way the Middlesex structure is that we try and make every level um, that a kid can play is almost their Everest. Like, if you're, you can be the best borough cricketer, and that's your Everest, we need to make that the best experience for them that they want to play again and again and then you go to the next level which is obviously the regional you know some people might not get back get past that stage but we do pride ourselves on out of the the, the academy boys that we have and obviously the, the county boys as well we get 90 or 95 percent of our selections right we might miss a few um but we get them a year later so um you know that goes down to all the, the guys down within the borough coaches and the borough lead coaches that we have as well so yeah i think that if you have a kid who loves cricket who has a passion for cricket you know there's an opportunity to play a higher standard other than club cricket or school cricket which which they've already played i also think with with that set up now in mind the the regional the regional game obviously it does separate the better kids as well it gives them the opportunity to better coaching but i think even at the club level like at, at, at where you play you might play the Premier Division at in the Middlesex leagues or the Kent leagues or the Surrey leagues. There's still opportunities there for them to one, yes, you can make a, a some decent amount of money, mm. but two, you are going to be playing against some pretty decent oppos- opposition because I say some of the Middlesex boys go probably go back and play for a Premier club side if they if they can. Um, yeah. We've heard stories like how like some some of the players that get to play is Alpington like Ryan Tenderscarta and Nilo Bright and so like there, there's definitely still that opportunity where I like I like that idea of like it might be an out an Everest but if cricket is a passion you can still like make something of yourself with it. Yeah, it, I mean, just thinking about the I know I think that what Kent did in their Premier League is the the team that went up so if Auburn went up to Premier League they would get the pick of the the best county professionals that were going to play loads of games of cricket for them so yeah. and I think that helps I know I play at Welling Garden City um, and our professional is O.A. Shah um, so just that he's my best mate but having <laughs> the boys having having Ace in the changing room you know yes we have to pay X amount of hundreds of pounds for him to be there but the, the knowledge that he can pass on and just being around him is it, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's priceless. You can't, you're not going to get that opportunity every Saturday to sit next to Ace and talk about how he plays spin or how he plays fastball or tell stories from the IPL. So I think, you know, and you're always going to have people say, well, you shouldn't pay people. But I don't think there's a Premier League in the country that doesn't pay people to play cricket because it's a way of making money and it improves the standard of cricket. That, mm. as you said, you know, Auburn to get promoted into the Premier League, they're playing against Joe Denley, Niall O'Brien, Neil Dexter, and, and Brian Jones and James Treadwell. Um, it's, it's only going to make him more. No, Gary Jones plays more. regional cricket now, doesn't he? He plays regional Premier. League. Yeah, I, I think I saw a picture of actually him getting getting bowled on Twitter about a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> he, I think he's a bowler now as well, is he? <laughs> it, which is quite quite funny. But um, I, was, that's, that's, <laughs> I was watching the uh, the Ashes the Ashes documentary. Two thousand five. Yeah. Yeah, with it, and obviously it's it's, it's still. We're listening to him talk about that catch, etc. Yeah. So go out if you're listening. We'd love to have you on. Um, you should get him on. He's a good lad. I suppose moving on to obviously your county career. So Lords is, I mean, the, the the sacred home of cricket. If you like, it's probably the yeah. best way of describing it. How is it having that as your home ground? Um, another cliche, but you actually take it for granted. You only when you. And I had this conversation with Oasis as well that 
when uh, when he was thinking, well, I'm just digressing slightly, but when he was actually thinking about leaving the Middlesex, I think before he went to Essex the year before, he actually walked around Lords and just went, what on earth am I leaving this place for? Um, and it's only when you actually sit back, you know, you, and you, you talk talk to people about, you play cricket and where, who do you play for, Middlesex, and, oh, you played at Lords. And only when you, I found that you almost take it for granted a little bit. Um, yes, when I made my debut against Gloucestershire, walking out and you think, Christ, this is it. But then it, it just comes the norm. It becomes that every other week you're going to play there, whether it's a one-day game or a four-day game. Um, and it's your, it's your home ground. It's, you know, I, I think when when I stopped playing first-class cricket, I played some minor county stuff and I played for Hertfordshire. And we went back there to play a Lord's final. Um, and I was actually really nervous. And people sort of said, if you're not, for some reason, because, you know, it's, it's, it's new again. Um, but yeah, but going back to your question, it's, you take it for granted, but in terms of the grass is magnificent, the wickets are magnificent, the, the stands are great, the, the history that, that goes with it is, is fantastic. And walking down sort of through the long room and stuff, you, you do take it for granted. And I, I did take it for granted. Only when I stopped playing, you think, wow, I used to play there, but you didn't almost take everything in um, to what was around you. How many wickets did the slope buy you? <laughs> loads, loads, um, and having good slip catches as well. Um, we had a very good slip, Gordon. But you don't until you actually stand on it, as in on, on, on the actual crease, and you take your stance for bowling a ball. You realise how like steep it is. Uh, the angle is is quite. You stand, you sort of back from the nursery, and you sort of fall over, and then if you put, you, know, you fall the other way. So, but in terms of, I always bowled um, from. The nursery end because the slope helped with my waist fingers and, and took the ball down the slope as well. So yeah, lots. But it takes a while. It took me a while to actually. People sort of said, you know, be, be careful of the slope, and you're like, it's not that bad. But it's actually you just literally bowl the ball and you fall off down towards the, the offside. So um, yeah, that, it helped. It helped, but it wasn't <laughs> swinging. It just nipped a bit as well. Did you um? Did you make it onto the honours board? No, the only I don't think the they do. I don't think they do five. Um, they don't do Middlesex. I'm not sure if Middlesex has been out there for a year, but I don't know if Middlesex do honours boards in the thing. I think it's only International. internationals. Okay. Um, I think that yeah, when what when where I sat, it was, it was quite full anyway. But I think only the international um, English international hundreds and five has go up on the board. Um, I don't think they won five for twelve against North Ants. <laughs> Jay <laughs> Hewitt. <laughs> well, I was going to come on to that. So. I mean, your best bowling performance uh, when reading about some of the stuff online is comes against, I think it's Glamorgan you played against, and it was yeah. the, the six for 14. Um, yeah. And Angus Fraser, another, another good name to have, yeah. cleaned, up, cleaned up the rest for you. Um, is that the, the best you've ever bowled? No, it wasn't. Um, they're, they're my best... Bowling figures. Um, it's actually the the bit prior to that that we we me and Phil Tufnell um, we were nine down and we were about uh, we we're about ten behind them I think roughly and then me and Cap put on a wick a, a, a last wicket stand of about forty something which then um, got us into whatever whatever region of um, being in front and then when we went out to and they had Waka Yunus as well, and he was bowling very, very quickly. Um, <laughs> and Cat wasn't a massive fan of getting in line. So I took, I took Waka, and he had some other Steve Watkins who bowled it at 25 miles an hour. Um, and then we went out. I think Gus, Gus might have got the first three wickets. And I remember, I thought I was bowling okay. I remember going down to Fry Leg, and I was thinking, oh, I'd like to get one. Let me get one. And then I got loads in a row, and then Gus got the other, the other one or two. So and then we bowled him out for 31 or, or 30. Um, but yeah, it's probably the most that I'm known for in terms of 614 and me and Fraze bowled out uh, Glamorgan, but it came out nicely, but like I remember nicking one lap, I think Adrian Shaw, the keeper, and Mike Gatting dropped him at slip. And then the next ball I did exactly the same thing and, and Gat caught it. So everything sort of went the way it was supposed sure. to. I remember Hugh Morris clipped one off, um, off his hips and Jack Callis, at, I think he was a gully, behind sort of square gully caught it um so yeah it just sort of went for me um and yes yeah, Deji it happens like that Deji's gonna bowl a pile of crap and get five and then you <laughs> bowl really well and you get none but 
So yeah, well, that's, that's what um, I, I mean. I think I listened to Stuart Broad talking about it with Jimmy Anderson when Broadley took seven or, or eight against the Aussies um, at Trent Bridge, um, and he he, he recalls he's like, I, he's like, I don't even think I bowled that well that day. <laughs> he's like Jimmy bowled so well, and he didn't get any any rewards. And then I just I just put him in put him somewhere about the right areas and got all the yeah. rewards. And they nicked so, it. Yeah, but it happens like that. It happens like you know when I think when you're batting as well, you can feel feel terrible, but find your way into 40s and 50s and you find your rhythm so yeah it does happen like that um but that was just that was just my day so um it was a good day it was a good night as well <laughs> i can imagine to be fair um so you re- you've obviously got a, you've obviously got a county cap from the sex which yeah is amazing but when when was your best cricket that you played where what, what sort of period was it and i think um from Make my debut, I think, in 96 was that. I think from 97, so 90, 97 season, 98 and 99, that was probably my best years. Um, I was injury-free um, and I just I just played. Um, they were probably my best years of consistently backing up performances. Um, and then I felt called 2000, I got injured, I think. Um, and then 2001, I could... I was sort of, I wasn't getting any better. Um, and I actually asked to leave, actually. I was in Perth in 2001. I asked to leave because I wasn't going anywhere. And I thought, for a couple of 18 months, I'd sort of stood still and saw people around me getting better. And I thought, I need a different challenge. And I actually spoke to John Embry, who was a coach then. And I said to Embers while I was in Perth, I was like, well, I actually want me, want me to go there. I haven't done anything here for, for 18 months. Can I go? And he sort of said, "No, no, no! You're the future of the club. You know, David Nash, O.A. Shah, Strauss, and Ben Hutton." And I was like, "But I'm not. Good. I hadn't played a great deal of first-class cricket at that 2000 season." Um, and I said, Look, "I just, I just want to sort of go." And he said, "No, no, we want you to stay." And I was like, "Okay, fine." Um, and about four months into the summer, they said, "Yeah, we we're going to release you." And I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> you know, you said six, but um, those probably three years of 90, maybe 96, 97, 98. Um, 99 were my best years where I just ran in, I just ran in a bold um, and it swung um, and everything sort of worked for me. How, how sort of quick do you think you were? Uh, I was around 80, 80 miles an hour, 80, 80, 81, 82, top whack. I used to swing the ball have a lot and I, I tell everyone what I lacked for in pace that so I made up for um, in swing. I always give myself, I was a poor man's Jimmy Anderson, like I could swing <laughs> the ball both ways, but about 10 miles an hour slower. So before I touch on to the ne- next topic, let's let's talk about those those the, the the glory years, if you like. What's some of the highlights that stand out, and and what is your best wicket you've ever taken? So um, my my greatest day in a Middlesex shirt, outside of um, making my first class debut, um, I got a wicket with my first ball in first class cricket. Um, and my second ball got dropped at slip um, by someone. So that was a quite a good start. Um, in 2001, we beat Australia. We played Australia at Lords, um, and we beat them in one day game. And there was about 25,000 people in Lords, and it was like today. It was amazing. That was probably my best day as a uh, Australian cricket, as a Middlesex cricketer, um, in terms of. And that was when they had a, the proper side. They had everyone. Um, in it with the, the War Twins and Warren McGrath, Brett Lee, Gillespie, the, you name it, they had it. Um, so that's probably um, my best memory uh, from a Middlesex playing um, day. That was that was fantastic. And your best wicket, or your most, your the biggest name, if you like. So my f- most famous wicket is Sachin Tendulkar. So I got him out. Um, I think. 95 we played India in a one day game um that was probably my best my best wicket most named wicket <laughs> um as as I say so yeah that was probably one that I'll uh, cherish and I have cherished since then so that's the title written I got a Sachin Tendulkar out yeah. title we of the podcast to... we'll get the views in India then um, <laughs> we, went to... <laughs> we went to like where I, go, I work at a school uh Haberdash's school in uh, Elstree we, we went to Sri Lanka a couple of years ago and the boys were just sitting there and the head of cricket sort of said, you know, we were talking about things and um, one of the boys actually said, uh, he said, oh, Huey, who, who's your most famous wicket? 
and I, I was just getting up to, to go and do something. I said, oh, I've got Sachin Chintin Dorka out. And they no, none of them believed me one word of what I said. And then DK, Dan Kerry, said he did actually. He did, he did actually get him out. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's how did you, how did you get about. him out? Caught slip. Caught slip. First, second, third. Talk uh, us for it. Second. <laughs> I just, I ran up and... Oh, he was like... I don't know. I was, you stand at the end of your mark and... I did it when the Australia, we played Australia and he stood it in the mark and I had Matt Hayden down there and when you think, Christ, how on earth is this not going to end up, end up bad for me? So I just ended up, I just run up and it was quite, quite a damp morning and it just, just nipped down the hill. Um, so yeah, it was the uh, same thing. You sort of, you do it, yeah, brilliant, well done. And then you sit down at the end and go, wow, I don't that was quite a good wicket for me. That's not a bad memory to No. <laughs> Big Mac, who's your most famous wicket? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, probably Yonker. He's a he's a bloke based with Bexley Heath. You know, really well known he is. Um, <laughs> if you're watching Yonker, I've got you twice. So. <laughs> um, but I know we touched upon the injury side of things now, and I, I think it's. I mean, as we're recording this, obviously this won't be released during this week, but it's obviously Mental Health Awareness Week. Yeah. Um, obviously injuries, especially for sports people, are such a, 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 I suppose, an issue when it comes to causing things like mental health problems, yeah. as well as obviously the physical pain that you go through. Um, yeah. So what, what were the injuries that you, you had and, and went through and, and, and talk about sort of the, the, the repercussions that it, it sort of led on to? Um, I mean, touch wood, I, was, I never had any real serious injuries like stress fractures and stuff. And I think because I, I didn't grow until I was 16, I didn't do an enormous amount of bowling from 11 to, to 15 because I just bowled my four overs and that was it. So um, the worst injury I had was a, I had a stress fracture in my right leg. So my back foot contact leg, um, but it was in 99. And as I said earlier on, for three years I bowled really well and I kept getting this pain in my leg and I was like, oh, it'd be fine. And I'll just get bowling with it. I kept bowling with it. And then we played, I remember we played, we played Derbyshire and our physio, um, he said, what's wrong with your leg? And I was like, nothing, it's fine. He said, you can tell you limping. And he said, uh, how long has it been going on? And so I said, oh, I don't know. He said, oh. so he said, oh, we're getting an x-ray. And apparently I had a crack in my shin that was about this big. And the physio said that if I had played the next day, he could, I could have snapped my shin properly. But I just didn't want to not play because I was bowling well. So, but like, you know, Back then, you didn't know about mental health. And I'll, I'll be honest, because I was bowling well and I was in the middle of a contract, they sent me to Blackpool and said, just go to Blackpool for a week, get away from it. And then I came back from that um, and it was fine. I, there wasn't an issue. I had like niggles, side strains and stuff, um, but never really, I never really looked as an, as an injury about, well, this could be the end of my career. It was only probably when I finished playing cricket that in 2004, three or four when I stopped playing for Kent that was probably when looking back that I was living in in Canterbury but I had Niall O'Brien uh, Neil Dexter Joe Denley was was staying with me every now and again um, I can't remember who else I had like one other they were staying in my house and pre-season turned up and I was coaching down at Canterbury in the afternoons, but all those boys were going to cricket in the morning and I was just sitting around my house and you hear stories about, you just didn't want to go out and stuff. And looking back, I struggled for probably about three months in terms of trying to get, I didn't know what was going on. I just thought I was a bit sad because I wasn't playing cricket, but looking back, it, it did affect me because you, you go from, I didn't miss the cricket because I wasn't any good anymore. I wasn't getting any better. I was on a in terms of technical ability, I was sort of on my way down. But you miss the, the camaraderie, and it's, you know, you hear footballers say, but you miss the banter, as you call it, the camaraderie between going to training, playing your games, going out at night time and having stuff to talk to. And those boys will come back, and I'd come back from coaching, and then they'd sit down and talk, and you think, I've got nothing to offer to this conversation because they've had, um, you know, a whole day of cricket. So it was only when I look back, it was that would have been a you know, whether you want to call it a mental health issue or depression. Um, it was probably something that I had, didn't realize I had it. Um, and then you know, you just grow out of it, and you accept that you're not going to play professional cricket anymore. Um, thankfully, when I finished in 2004, I went straight into playing minor county cricket and I had 10 years playing minor county cricket, so I almost went from the best case scenario to the next best case scenario. Yeah. And then when I finished playing minor county cricket, I was, I was done from 
from a representative. But yeah, going back to the mental health side of things, it would have been a good three months before I was like, yeah, you have to accept that you're no longer a professional. Any any advice you could give to any any young star or anyone that might be watching it that might have a, a niggle and is like in pain and struggling to essentially go out and play sports or, or, or anything that you can think of which is like best sort of advice that you could give? I think the, we had a chat yesterday with the Middlesex Academy boys and, and everything, do as much as you can before you go and bowl the ball before you, or in terms of your nutrition, your planning, your hydration. So give, you, give your body the best opportunity to perform at the highest level. And if, and if you do get injured, almost go down the route of the same thing, right, what do I need to do to get better? Uh, or to, to recover to give myself the best opportunity I use an example that I'm not too proud of but I remember I, I pulled my side in a second team game on a Friday I think it was a Friday or Thursday and I went out and got drunk that night in Canterbury um, and the physio said you just put your recovery back three and a half weeks because the alcohol into the system and stuff so um, yeah just give yourself the best opportunity um, in terms of diet and stuff to, to, to recover um, try not to rush yourself back I know there's sometimes you can get if you know if he's an elite sportsman, if he's an elite batter or bowler, they try and rush you back as well. Um, and talk a lot of what we hear about now in terms of mental health is if you are struggling and you know you don't want to be seen, you want to be seen as a big macho person, but just talk to someone, talk to, talk, you know, share your problems with someone, um, express how you're feeling, um, and hopefully, you know, you can get through that. Uh, I don't think we could have said. It better ourselves. So um, we'll go on to that one season at Alpington then. So you've obviously signed for Kent. You've been released. Well, it's it gone to Kent. Um, Garden of England. We all love it. I'm actually down in Folkestone at the moment. So I'm in right in the middle. Right, right in the middle of Kent now. Um, so did you, had you had heard of Alpington before, before <laughs> being told that you were going to be playing for them? Only on M25. Only <laughs> going on M25. Um, when I, I think I, I arrived um, in the, that winter, um, and not too fair, I was good friends with Joe, and Joe was at Whitstable, um, and he said, oh, why don't you come and play with us? You know, I got to know, uh, Joe's one of my best friends. He's godparent to one of my kids. Um, I was like, okay, fine. So I went to, to see... Um, Dave Fulton, I think at the time, or, or Matthew Fleming. And I said, what do we do about club cricket? He said, oh, you're going to play for Orpington. I was like, okay. He said, because we thought you might be living in London and you could just sort of scoot round the thing. But at that time I moved up to Canterbury. So I was like, okay, fine. And I think that year was the, the only one and only year where they went Saturday to Saturday. So yeah, it was two, two, it was two, two Saturdays. Saturdays cricket, yeah, yeah. which was, was brilliant. Fun. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant but yeah so um i was like okay fine um i didn't know anything nobody knew anything about orpington um and i remember the first game we played it was a it was a home game and i thought right I, I, I better i thought i'd get there a little bit early and I, I remember driving up and i sort of parked and sort of looked around i was like shit there's no one here <laughs> so i just rung i can't remember i think i run somewhere i said is, is i got the right day and stuff and then it was all boarded up um and then about an hour later, someone started turning up, and I was like, "Hi, I'm yeah. Jamie. Yeah, I'm here to play cricket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, your, I'm your professional. I'm not a very good one anymore, but I'm your, I'm your professional." So you mentioned that you parked your car. What has actually sent me a, a nice little message? He, he's asked. So that car at that time would have been a, a yellow sports car, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, have you a, still got it? How's it doing? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those cringy moments. Back then, I had. Uh, Long, long curtains that were yellow. I'm sure uh, I could pick up a photo. Yeah, I'm sure you could. Um, um, and I had a yellow MG. I had a silver one actually. And they were, I loved them. I was sort of in love with them. And yeah, I had a, a yellow MG um, car that was very nice, but yeah, it just stood out a little bit. Um, <laughs> Matches yeah, with club colours. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I think in, in terms of um, the year, I think we we, we lost most games. Um, I don't think I'd performed with either bat or ball. Um, but we used to get two bats a week um, and then we'd bowl all day the following week. I think we won one game, actually. I think we outrighted someone. I can't actually remember um, who it was, but I do. I think we actually won one game. I've, I think, you know what? You joined Alpington, I think. Uh, well, your you season at Alpington was probably at the, the worst time because we'd just been promoted to the Premier Division. Yeah. And 
obviously we went from one day cricket to two day cricket and that's when the likes of Neil Taylor left yeah. and there was a fair few I think uh, that followed followed with him because I'm, I'm not being funny but people that play club cricket probably didn't want to play two day mm, cricket, two-day cricket yeah. um, and, I, I, and I think obviously you look at some of the, the players that you played with some of them obviously still around um, but the the memory that gets told and is folklore I suppose um it's a game against Seven Oaks Vine. It might be one of the last games of the season. Um, I think you, you you scored a few in the first. I think you scored 91 in the first innings. Um, and um, there was a declaration with not many put forward to win. Um, I think you, you, you were batted, uh, must have batted, obviously batted first. And then we got to one run ahead. And then you decided to declare... And with one, and he just took one ball. I think you put a part-time ball or in game <laughs> one ball, and he he gets he got he got hit clarted for six. Uh, I never, I never sort of sat on the Saturday morning and thought, Christ, I've got to go and play for Auckland. I have good fun memories of we, you know, we got battered every week, but you know, we kept turning up and we kept having a laugh as well. So, um, yeah. I, you know, I talk to the talk to people. The people sort of say, "How many clubs you play for?" Obviously, played quite a few. And I always mentioned Orpington because it was the, the first year that we <laughs> I'd ever played outside of being in Australia, the Saturday yeah. to Saturday cricket. So yeah, it was. Yeah, what did you? Play? Oh, COVID. Sorry. What did you make of the social aspect at Orpington? <laughs> Every week, it was a fight to get out there get out of the club without having 15 beers um, thrown at you. Because I had to drive as well, and obviously it was only miles away, but I do remember staying around for beers. and they, I, I remember having like, they had massive, but I might be completely wrong, but tables in the middle of like the pavilion with just beers, jugs, and just <laughs> alcohol everywhere. It just, it was, I remember just one night, it was absolute carnage. Um, but yeah, very socially. Yeah, social fun. Orientated. <laughs> as as uh, you might have played with Pablo Sterling, um, but uh, as he as his motto is, win or lose, we're on the boots. Mm. Um, Absolutely. So obviously, Ken played. I, I don't think it, it, from the set, like from reading up, it doesn't seem like he played too many games for Ken. But obviously, yeah. we're there for a fair few years. Obviously, he came to retirement, played minor counties, but coaching is obviously a massive part of your life now and yeah. and, and, and from. So you're you're a, you're a level four coach. Yeah. Um, so you've got the James Hewitt Cricket Academy. You've got, yeah. obviously, you do some work in middle section. You've got the school. Yeah. What's next? Where, where, does, it, where does the coaching go from here? I think when, um, and this is someone's people say, have you always been interested in coaching? And I wasn't a massive, uh, massive fan of school. I liked school, but wasn't academically uh, sound, should we say. And my mum always said to me that, because I always thought my, I'm going to play professional cricket. Once I chose cricket over football or running, my, I, I thought I'm going to play till I'm 35 and then, then I'll be done. And then my mum sort of said, did you realise at 35 years old, unless you play for England, even if you play for England, you've got 30 years to earn more money. Um, and she sort of said, what do you enjoy doing? And even when I was 21 years old, I had a, a passion for coaching. I enjoyed it um, to get paid for it. So that's when I started doing my qualifications. Um, I did my level two first before my level one, then did level three, and then um, I think in 2007 or eight, I did my level four. Um, I think when I, when I came out of the game and I, I went on to my level four, I thought, right, I want to get back into first class cricket, I want to be a coach, whether it's a fast bowling coach, SNC, whatever. Um, and then halfway through that, my level four, we had Matt Maynard, who obviously played for England, John Morris, Grant Flower. Uh, who else we had? Uh, we, had a, we had about six guys who were first team coaches at county clubs at the start of my level four. Level four takes two years. And halfway through the, the two years, they'd all been sacked because the team wasn't doing very well. And I sort of sat down and thought, coaching's a bit like being a player. If you don't perform, you get sacked. If you're a coach, a bit like football nowadays, if, you, yeah. if, you, if your team don't perform, you, I was like, I don't need that that sort of stress in my life. I've had that for 10 years being a cricketer. So I sort of came out of there, went into, I did, I was director of cricket. But when I first stopped playing, I went to Oxfordshire, did some county, uh, coaching there, and then went to Hertfordshire, was director of cricket there, and then did a little bit of Bedfordshire work. But then around 2010, I thought, 
I need to do something that I, I'm in control of. Um, so I set up my Jamie Hickory Academy in 2008 and just did one-to-one -one stuff. And, um, and then the job at the school came along, which was linked to the Middlesex stuff. So um, I actually, I've got no, in, no aspirations to go any higher. Um, I, through the Middlesex stuff, so I work with the under 13s to the 15s, and then I work with the academy boys uh, I do a little bit work at the professionals uh, as well. I'm the lead fast bowling coach on the academy, but I've got no aspirations to be in that in that first class arena. <laughs> I mean, it's great going in there to catch a few balls, like Stephen Finn might want to catch a few balls, catch it, and then throw it back, and and then I'm done. So, you know, with the school and my academy stuff going on, you know, I, I have no aspirations to go any higher. There is a level five being thrown around, but I'm 44 years old. I don't need that um, <laughs> you know, to go any higher. I'm earning any more money so yeah so I'm, I'm happy where I am I, you know my kids play cricket um, I've stopped playing first team cricket at my club now I go and play in the fives and the fours with my 14 year old so um, yeah I'm, that must be I'm nice I, I know we're, we're, we're all pits and we've obviously had Big Mac you can test to that that you've obviously playing with your dad but obviously how, how good is how good is your, your son is he has he got yeah, he's right. He's he, both my sons are better than me are, than I was at, at, at one's eleven, uh, one's fourteen. So the eleven-year-old is definitely better than I was at eleven, and my oldest um, is definitely better than I was at fourteen. So they're both in the middle sex setup. Um, they're both bowlers as well. The oldest swings it away like I do, um, and the little one's just a bit erratic, but he can actually bowl it all right. So yeah, playing with them is. I mean, I play with my dad, as you said. You know, you've done probably as well that. I played my dad when I was younger and it's something that, you know, I could still play some for a first team cricket if I wanted to, but, you know, I can't stand in the field for 50 overs and go and have a bat. So I'm much more beneficial to him standing at mid off while he's bowling um, or when he's batting as well. So, yeah, it's... it's uh, how, how does the opposition <laughs> cope yeah. with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, Jake, 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 <laughs> he's got Sasha and Ted Dorker out here. Yeah? He's, he's at the top of his mark. Oh, good. <laughs> we played last year, actually. It was a funny story. We played my first... My son's first, second game for the fives. And the first team didn't have a game. So I said, I'll, I'll go and play with Joseph. That's my oldest son. And anyway, I turned up and we had to put all the cones out and it was on Astro and everything like that. And we, we, we turned up and everyone, the opposition... I thought oh, I'll be all right. I won't know any five, fifteen cricketers that played for for Datchet. Oh, that's what it was. Um, or Datchet, sorry. Um, and I turned up and I knew about eight of them. And they were like, "What are you doing here?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm just playing with my son." And I kept wicket, so I didn't, didn't bowl. And the actual league, because we had to, we had to clear for the league to say I could go from the first team to the fifth team. And the the league cleared it, um, but we bowled them out for 104. My son Joseph was batting. We were four down. We needed like six to win. And the captain said, can you put your pads on and go back with Joseph? So I just stood there with a bat in my hand and he bowled me a full toss and I just I smashed it miles. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Really, I really, this natural instinct came in. Anyway, the game was over. We won by six wickets. Then on the Monday, they complained to the league to try and have our 15 kicked out of the league because... I played 15 cricket and it was just ridiculous. Absolutely. I said, I kept wicket and I hit one ball for six accidentally and we won by six <laughs> wickets. So it, it was ridiculous. So, I, love fact, I love the fact you've accidentally hit a ball for six. <laughs> <laughs> so, not, not a lot sorry. of <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so we'll move on to the, the everyone's favourite section, I should say. It's the, it's the 1 to 11 side of things. What I love about you, Jamie, is that you've got two teams prepared. So <laughs> immediately your homework is better than everyone else's. Um, and then afterwards we go on to Big Mac's um, 1 to 11 special, which is usually a terrible pun based off someone's name or something like that. But um, So you want to do your 1 to 11 of players you played with? Like? Yes. Um, okay, so guys I played with, uh, the best I got to, actually got to 12, Justin Langer. Uh, Stephen Fleming, I put Joe Denley in there, um, Jack Callis, Greg Blewett, Mark Ramprakash, Mike Gatting, O.A. Shah, Phil Tufnell, Andy Simons, Mullery Duran, and Angus Fraser. I'm sure I've left out loads, but... 
Just, Justin Langer, I've, I've heard from watching the test, yeah. does he, did he train as hard as he coaches? Yeah, because he's, he's, it is literally, that is him in a nutshell. How he, how he, how he went about his mindset and he was, he was, it was more than 100% every ball. Um, I remember he, if he didn't score 100, he'd get out, he'd walk around the nursery, he'd run 100 singles. So his brain felt like he scored 100. Um, he expected everyone to be on point every ball all the time, all the way through the summer. And it worked a lot of for the younger, white, young, us younger guys because it, it's Justin Langer. If Justin Langer said, jump in the air, you jump in the air. But some of the older boys, they, they were a little bit more... Hang on a minute, I played 15 years of first class cricket. I don't need to be as switched on. But yeah, he's he was a lovely, a lovely, lovely lad. Um, but it's just a lunatic. And how he is in that test series is exactly the same. You know, I think in one of the, the segments, it had Usman Khawaja basically saying to him, we're walking around on eggshells because we're worried you're going to explode. And that's exactly the same way as he was when you think, oh, what, 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 what sort of mood he's in? I remember once he got out, at Lords, and we used to get massive cakes, like trays of cakes, brought down from uh, upstairs onto into the changing room. And he picked them all up and threw them all in the bin and said, "You fuckers don't deserve those cakes." So yeah, he's a bit of a lunatic, but I love you. <laughs> I can imagine how what upset me and you would be at two. Like, what did that <laughs> mean, man? Can you imagine? What are the <laughs> one of the guys actually, one of the guys that called Paul Weeks, he actually went into the bin and took them out. He said, I, "I look forward to my cakes." I <laughs> identify with him so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll go on to players you have played against. Um, okay, so we've got Alistair Cook, Graham Gooch, Sachin Tendulkar, Brian Lara. Ricky Ponting, uh, Mark War, Steve War, Hayden, McGrath, Warren, Lee, Shai Bakhtar, Kevin Peterson, Sakhle Mushtak, Alan Donald, Wako Yunus, Wazim Akram, Herschel Gibbs. Some, some family household names in there. They were household, literally. Did you ever get Peterson out? No, he he uh, he actually made me realise that he was on a different level. I mean, we played against him at, when he was at Knotts, and we were playing at Lords. And I think by the last session we walked out, I had three for about forty of about twenty overs, bowling really well. Um, I bowled from the pavilion end, and the ball was going up the slope, which means for me it was a good gauge that my wrist was on the ball. And I was swinging it; he just kept hitting me back down through mid on and I was like I said I remember I think I said to phrase I said I can't bowl at this bloke I literally can't bowl it I bowled a bouncer he hit it onto the scoreboard it rebounded within five yards of my run up I was like this bloke's too good for me I'm never <laughs> gonna get this bloke out. Okay perfect but yeah some, he was some, very good. Some amazing names there and I look forward to editing some of their photos into <laughs> into that. Um Big Mac your yeah. famous one to eleven so yeah, you did the. So we've we've seen some some all we've seen all sorts, and all sorts yeah, is, is not a bad way of putting it this week, is it? No. It no. Um, so I, so I had prepared a one to eleven, which, um, I presented to Jack before we started recording, and he told me basically it was rubbish, and that he had an idea which he wished he'd told me earlier in the week. Um, however, I have managed to turn his idea into a reality. Uh, with the Chewit 11. So, uh, the JB Chewit so, 11. <laughs> Jamie Chewit. So, um, they, it was going to be sweet, but I, yeah, good luck with that. I, I've got gone for general food items, um, including a special shout out for Jack, who did give me one of them, uh, which I've just tweaked slightly to make it more uh, relevant. Um, so, opening the batting, this is not in a real order, by the way, these people would not necessarily bat this way. Uh, I've got Chris Wattsit. Hey, good. <laughs> uh, Brilliant. And a, a number, uh, already at number two, um, he's a third and fourth team current opening bowler and a really, really top bloke, Christian van der Berger. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and then this is, this is Jack's input to the team, which is Harry Bow Patel. Uh, number four, <laughs> I'm not happy with, um, Ben Clark Sonny D. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, five's a classic Steve Coleman's mustard I like uh, could have had a few there 
Uh, six, uh, close to home this one, uh, Paul McCrackers. Uh, number seven, you're going to like this one, Jack. James Fothering Ham, Egg and Chips. <laughs> Good. Uh, this next one is a bit of a niche one. It's Mike Chicken Tonight. Chicken, Mike Night, Mike Chicken Tonight, God. Terrible. Uh, number nine, Joe Cheese Stringer. <laughs> uh, the number 10 is Aaron San de Hula Hoop <laughs> um, that one works for spelling not so much in the pronunciation uh, and where would you eat all of these items well obviously you would go to number 11 the Neil Catherton <laughs> can we uh, can we just the most obvious one the Ben McCracken Big Mac how have oh, you not made the oh, yeah. Chew It, a chew it 11? <laughs> I your, name, your nickname is a delicacy. That's your best one so far. You picked. I, don't, I think it goes downhill from here. Um, oh, it went, it's always going to go downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, boys. Thank you. I, I mean... Um, I've, I've, I say you're, you're definitely on to our. I'm going to do like a top gear list now of people that play county cricket and see how far I can get. If you want to, if you want to nominate one of your friends to come on and uh, yes. and uh, and help us, you know, get out. We um, don't get don't don't ask Denley whatever you do because my dad will be itching at the door because he got him out when he was 15. <laughs> I'll speak to. Um, I'll have a chat with Joe because, um, as I said, I'm still in contact with him quite a lot. Um, so I will, I will float the idea. He's not doing much at the moment. Or he's probably hitting some balls at the moment. But I'll speak to some of the boys um, in a round. Um, oh, HR as well. I, my yeah, I was say, I'd, idolises. Yeah, I, I can... Um, him, so he he's has, just, to be fair, he, at the moment he's doing... Um, he's doing a lot of these at the moment, like, like podcasty type things. Um, so, yeah, I'll, um, I'll just tell him to come on. So if you... <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I'll speak to him. And then um, if I just uh, drop you a line... Jack, just to say yes or no. He should be fine. Um, he's not doing anything else. So, yeah. Boys. Perfect. Jamie, you, know, you have been an absolute star. Um, and look, if you ever find yourself in Orpington with that yellow car, you can leave it at Big Mac's house and we'll go to, we'll go to, we'll go for a pint. I'll go for 25 pints. <laughs> WKD Blues. Perfect. Thank you, boys. Cheers, Jamie. Thank, Thank you. Awesome. See you, boys. Thank you.